Let me take you on a quick tour of Calgary. First thing you'll notice, the skyline. With the mountains in the background, it's good. You'll probably take a picture. As you move towards the inner city, you'll feel its culture, the varying neighborhoods. You'll see art. Something will jump out at you. Oh, I should check that out, you might say to yourself. Welcome to Calgary. The place is bustling. Yeah, see, most people are surprised when they get here. They expect something a little more, uh, rustic. Anyway, settle in. You've got a million different things to do, people to meet, places to see. Start with a little food, maybe. Check out the culinary scene. A lot of options. Some of the best restaurants in the country are here. Feel like partying? You more of like a dive bar type, or do you want to hit the club? We could do a beer hall or billiards, live music, whatever you want, we got you. There's major events year-round, pro sports, live music, major acts come through here constantly. There's something going on every night. If you're a morning person, maybe get up early and take in some of the great outdoors. The city's covered in pathways. The longest paved urban pathway system on the continent, in fact. It's over a thousand kilometers, or around 620 miles if you don't speak metric. So go for a ride, hit up a park. Go fishing right downtown if that's more your thing. The inner city's got beautiful outdoor spots, and then there's like the outdoors outdoors. Head west about an hour, and you'll find yourself right here. Yeah, remember to breathe. See, Calgary's got the unique pleasure of being a major metropolitan city while also being a stunning outdoor destination. All the arts, culture, events, dining, and nightlife surrounded in the most beautiful, most fun mountain and park areas that ever graced your eyes. Then look, I don't know exactly what you're looking for or what your idea of a good time is, but what I do know is that you will find it right here in Calgary. Try us. Be part of the energy. In Calgary, Alberta, we love to make movies. And honestly, we're really good at it. And it's because we got a few tricks up our sleeve. It starts with this building right here. It's our film studio. It serviced a ton of productions of all sizes. Commercials, series TV, features, whatever you got. It's 80,000 square feet, three sound stages, an entire rental house right on site. It's the whole deal and then some. But here's the kicker. It's smack dab in the middle of the world's most beautiful, iconic locations. The biggest skies and the best light. In fact, in the right months, golden hour light lasts like six hours. Yeah. Our versatility is ridiculous. You can have Leo mauled by a bear in the mountains on his way to his first Oscar in the morning, and then put him on a soundstage that afternoon. We've doubled as downtown LA, Westeros, Denver, outer space, and Fargo, Minnesota for three seasons. We've done a ton of period work, from the beginning of time to the far reaches of tomorrow. Filmmaking around here is a chance to work adventurously. It's fun. Plus, we're easy on your wallet, nice on the eyes, and talented as hell in every department. So no matter the genre, period, or scale of your project, Calgary, Alberta is the place to bring it to life. Be part of the energy. I'm Bernadette Cerenazzo, and I am a proud Film Circle member. The films that come to the city of Calgary for this unique event really give you uh, an international feeling you really believe and know that you're seeing some of the greatest works from young filmmakers all over the world. Everything is connected and it's not humans and animals or humans and the nature around us. You know, we're all connected. And that acknowledgement is a way to acknowledge that we're coexisting in this land with the native people and we should acknowledge that this is actually their traditional territory. But at the same time, we are all guests to this land.
Hello, everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Thank you for joining us for this year's online version of DGC Visionaries. Over the last few years, DGC Visionaries has become a must attend event at many of our top film festivals, bringing together some of the most interesting filmmakers with films at the fests. This year, we're talking to taking visionaries online and sharing it clear across the country, highlighting as many brilliant filmmakers as we can. All DGC Visionary sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the DGC National YouTube channel. I'm thrilled and honored to be here with these guests tonight. We're speaking with Métis filmmakers Benjamin Ross Hayden and Shane Belcourt about Benjamin's sophomore film, Parallel Minds, currently playing at the Calgary International Film Festival and booked for a theatrical across Canada. I cannot think of anyone better to lead this conversation than Shane Belcourt. Shane is an award-winning and two-time CSA-nominated filmmaker based in Toronto. As a writer and director on many Indigenous works in both narrative and factual, Shane has a vested interest in creating works that speak to his Métis heritage. Notable work includes the feature film Tikarondo, the dance documentary Gahawe, The Cycle of Life, 2015 CSA Best Direction nomination, and two historical Canada Minutes, Kajoni Wenjak and Nasku Mituin Treaty. I tried, Shane, I tried. Uh, recent works include the award-winning 2018 CBC first-hand documentary Indictment, co-directed with Lisa Jackson. Uh, and was the imaginative best documentary and the music documentary series Amplify for APTN, where he was the series creator, executive producer, and showrunner. And the dramatic feature recently, Red Rover, where, which he co wrote and directed. He's an alumna of the TIFF Talent Lab and NSI's Totally Television programs. I'm thrilled to introduce our featured director tonight. Benjamin Ross Hayden is a Métis film director, screenwriter, and producer from the Duck Lake Batoche region and is based in Alberta, Canada. Hayden debuted in the Telefilm Canada micro-budget program in the roles of director, writer, and producer, which, ran, uh, which then was in Perspectives Canada at the Cannes Film Festival. Two years later, Hayden was already greenlit to direct and produce his third theatrical feature. Hayden's sophomore feature, Parallel Minds, which we're talking about tonight, stars highly acclaimed science fiction actor Greg Brick, Ad Astra and Code 8 are among his credits, and the great Tommy Amber Peary from The Expanse and is distributed by Level Film. The story earned a competitive television license for primetime broadcast across Canada on APTN. Accepted to six international film festivals, including Fantaspoa Fantastic Film Festival in Brazil, the Calgary International Film Festival, Blood in the Snow in Toronto, and many others. From writing and directing two features in the span of one year, his storytelling focus is visual and character driven, exploring social and political topics with high concept scope and style. Vice ID Magazine lauded his first feature, The Northlander, which we'll also be talking about tonight, as one of Indigenous cinema's most important films. Northlander is sold to over 30 territories, premiering in 15 international film festivals, including Imaginative, Montreal World Film Festival, with ongoing broadcasts on APTN and Hollywood Suite. Hayden remains committed to storytelling in times beyond the present to inspire new generations through Indigenous futurism to explore new stories and progress Métis culture and Indigenous issues as cinema for the world. It is my pleasure to welcome Benjamin Ross Hayden and Shane Belcourt. Come on in. There's Shane, <laughs> welcome. And there's Ben. Hello. Hello. Welcome guys, great to have you here. Hello. Thank you. We're representing both the sides here, Hans. I don't know if you noticed that I'm, I'm wearing the, uh, I got the blue on. Hayden's got the, uh, Benjamin's got the red on. Very good. We're representing Very good. both sides of the Métis uh, <laughs> Northwest for me, and uh, he's got the bay down there. Fantastic. Before I, hand it over, before I hand it over to Shane and Benjamin, uh, to those tuning in, I'd like to point out the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. That's where you can type questions in for Shane. He'll be watching 
for those questions throughout the conversation uh, and try to get to as many of them as he can. Don't be shy, type them in there. Shane will be looking for those. Uh, that's all for me. Really looking forward to this conversation and I will see you at the end. Have a great time. See you on the other side, Hans. And a tremendous thank you uh, to Shane and everyone tuning in and tremendous thanks to Directors Guild of Canada National and Hans Engel, Ryan Tonelli for everything leading up to tonight's masterclass. It's a pleasure to be giving the talk tonight and, to, and thanks to the Guild for showcasing and, and putting me up against the wall and, and having me join the Directors Guild last year. Yeah, you got me. And, uh, and I always look to the day where I'd be able to have this great privilege being a director in the Guild. So thank you. A thank you to Telephone Canada, Canada Media Fund and Indigenous Screen Office for your support. And I have more thanks to thank, but uh, it's great to speak with you, Shane. So where do we begin? <laughs> well, uh, you know, thanks for having me on board to uh, talk about your wonderful film, Parallel Minds, this new sophomore film that's come out. And uh, I, mean, I think last time we were speaking about it real briefly, you had mentioned that uh, it uh, had a great premiere screening at the Calgary International Film Festival. Do you want to tell us, you know, a little bit about, you know, what that was like? Sure. I mean, you know, it's it's certainly not often when uh, a Calgary made film actually opens the Calgary Film Festival. So that was a real honor. And the film sold out in about eight hours. So uh, everyone who came to watch the film and saw it, uh, it they their responses were, were great across the board. Uh, I was I was really curious to see it, you know, of course, in its big theatrical setting. And so that's that's what's really important to to all of us in, in, in Canada for these feature films that we make when we, you know, we, we, we work so hard on for about a year, year and a half sometimes and then all of a sudden when it's there on the big screen and then you know to see it um you know take place in you know 13 other cities as well internationally around the world uh coming coming up soon is also really incredible too um but i mean enough about talking about the film why don't we uh why don't we roll a trailer and and uh and see what it's all about so let's uh let's play it and show the world what it is if you uh the elders say Every decision you make today affects the next seven generations. Never let time run out on the dreams you can see. Red eyes close, Elise. Close but still unstable. We are made up of our experiences. Red eye is the contact lens. It records not what the eye can see, but what the mind can remember. Elise is not ready. This is the new red eye. We have a lot more questions about her death than answers. I got a helmet for you to crack. What Elise was doing, it's waking something up. The truth is there. We just don't see it yet. Is there a problem with the new red eye? Why don't I show you? Here we go. I must be like you. More human. What the hell is going on? Something's wrong with Red Eye. It's manipulating memories. What powers them? Adrenaline, serotonin. It's harvesting us. Do you have another vision? I can't tell anymore if they're real or not. I programmed you. I control you. Not anymore. Look at what you've made. <laughs> Kapow! <laughs> Very awesome. Very exciting. What? Uh, so, first question: What made you want to write a love poem to about the internet? What was the, your? Uh... <laughs> no, I was actually honestly. What was the? Um, what was the? I mean, we, you speak about indigenous futurism when you speak about you know your work in general, but it's particularly this film, you get a real sense of it in Parallel Minds. So I'm just curious, like how the story came about. Let's start right from the beginning. Like what was it you thought, okay, this is the theme, this is what I want to explore. And tell me about it, because you're also a writer and director on this work, which is really significant. So let's talk about the writing process just a little bit. Great. Okay. So, you know, just from what everyone saw just now, in the near future, it's uh, the tech firm called Red Eye. They're, they're on the verge of developing a revolutionary contact lens that records human sight to replicate memories. And the device uses an artificially engineered intelligence known as ERM. When, and there's a company's uh, lead researcher who, who's strangely murdered at the time of the technology's release. 
Thomas Elliott is an old fashioned police detective played by Greg Brick, who investigates with uh, a researcher from the company named Margo Elson, played by Tommy Amber Peary, who are, they're drawn deeper into, to apprehend this elusive digital shapeshifter. And, uh, and then both, they're, they're soon uh, terrifyingly threatened by memories of their past, the deeper that they continue to seek in uncovering, I guess what, what this dangerous artificial intelligence is trying to consume. Now, I guess, okay, let's, let's start by, let's start at the beginning. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm a Canadian filmmaker. Um, I, 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 when I got started, I just had stories, you know, talk about backstory, much, much like, like a director has to wear many hats. You know, I got started I, I picking up a camera, composition. At the same time, I, I you know, I, I, I would also try, you know, uh, watching the important classics, the art of directing or, or getting on stage and acting, which is performance, you know, and then, and then I learned there's a whole business to it you know, the mechanics of directing in Canada. And every time one starts to talk about directing, you know, it can get really specific, you know, down the rabbit hole into, in, into the field on, on, on just one aspect of the craft when, when, when we have a good discussion like this. But all the time when, when you're there on set on a film like Parallel Minds, you know, it's always this centrifuge of story and, and all these different streams are coming at you at the same time asking to be dealt with, you know, like, like and, and with years of building knowledge and experience as, as time goes by directing, you know, th those kinds of experiences, knowledge of telling more earlier stories in, in, your, in your, your career, going back to the very first films that you made can then creep along and inform you as you're telling stories, like in the case of Parallel Minds, where it was to me like a, a, uh, a it, was, it, was a, it was a message that I had long told myself that I, I, it was important to tell about artificial intelligence. And going back about uh, six or seven years when I was really no, t looking at things like uh, technological determinism and singularity theory. And this is, this is, you know, applying traditional knowledge against technological singularity. So, you know, that's the big themes of it. But as you know, Shane, you know, us directors, when we're working, you know, we just have those, we're in the middle, right? We have, we have to weave that story together. I mean, talking mechanics, right? After a take, you step in, you give the actor a note. What did they nail? What did they focus on? D give the DP an adjustment, wider lens, tighter, tighter shot, pick up or turn around, go again, move on, conveying conflict of, of, of the characters, uh, how much or how subtle, you know, conveying the big picture or feeling and is it is this feeling like the big picture it's supposed to be every moment think about the, the next blocking think about the next big scene after lunch uh, answer questions about how many do we need here or there or what about the color the quantity how does this look uh, how, how about you try x or try y wait time's up let's go move along and you have to make your day every day you know it's so fast that it's fluid but when it comes to the river of production remember as you know, once you open that gate and the stream of production starts to flow, there's no, there's no going back. There's, there's no going down, going back up the river. You can't do it. Your time's limited, finite, you know? The question is, what is your story? You know, so you need to know, is this the performance? Is this the angle? Is this good? And then you circle the take and move on. And these are the questions that I ask myself in the moment. Now, I like to work in unfamiliar territory each time for this time, Technology was, I looked at technology as a storytelling tool, old technology, new technology. And in the, in the time it's taken me to write and direct and release the film, I find myself questioning my relationship with technology. The more that I see it really endeavor to permeate our lives, many aspects of it, you know, target advertisements that seem to anticipate or a thought or an action that we just had a few days or, or hours ago. It knows a lot whatever it is, the AI. It's this omnipresent force in our lives. And, and we, we have to choose what our relationship is with it. You know, how can it be of help in the work that we do versus how much do we let it define how we experience the world around us was, was what I was thinking when coming up with the story. I mean, it seems so aware and so close to us that it doesn't seem like, it seems like a living thinking person. And that was the inspiration for ERM, the, the artificial intelligence that you see towards the end. The AI that is strangely alive and sentient, uh, that takes on a life of its own. 
I mean, the, the, the creation of Urn took, took the work of, you know, one unified vision between all these different layers of departments to, to bring it to life. Um, but, you know, all, you know, when you look at the themes of it, te technology can bring out our fondest memories or induce psychological entanglement or, or, or trauma. So I think that the parallels of old and new tech in the film are also an important reminder of, of, of the period of time that it, we, for us right now that we are in, um, you know, back then a tool was just a tool. You know, it wasn't a gateway to search out endless curiosities in a fully monitored mainframe. So, um, so to answer, to answer that question, uh, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Okay, so why don't we try to, that sounds like that's basically the overview of the whole talk today. So why don't we go into some of these things a little bit more with a bit more detail. So, and I was, I was kind of curious about, um, in, in quite taken by, uh, you know, you, the, the, your discussion there about uh, artificial intelligence and those that program it, give it a worldview. So those that write the code, that's the way the AI interacts with the world. And uh, even in your own film, the references of residential school and, you know, we're talking about colonization and sort of taking over the worldview or trying to reprogram, so to speak, the worldview of indigenous people. Um, there's simply quite powerful in that idea and that motif of your film that here it is, you're making a futuristic film in, in which indigenous people are um, they're in this next world, they're there in the future, they're existing, uh, Michelle Thrust character as, uh, you know, this brilliant engineer. And I love that, you know, like you're seeing indigenous people in the future, not only living lives, but, you know, having these, and the hacker character, you know, it, it's just wonderful work there on, on the script side, Benjamin. And I was wondering if you want to tell us a little bit more about the, about this conflict between this AI, which has a sort of consumption, colonial kind of taking worldview set against the elder character. And then it also kind of speaks to those who program AI, you know, what are they trying to program? What worldview, what ethics, what values, what cores are they putting into the AI? I, when I was watching your film, I was responding to the, because some of those themes that I thought were really, really uh, wonderfully realized visually, but I'm wondering on that, on that sort of script level, on the story level, um, as a director, as you're looking through the script, is that sort of is that sort of thematic part that you were really taken by, or what was the sort of theme that you were saying? This is what I want to really get into. Not so yeah. much in the day to day on set, but that sort of conceptual understanding your story. Well, you know, you know, on the deeper thematic level, very. I mean, the you know, in in the most uh, outside bracketed sense, fundamentally, Parallel Minds tells a story where on the surface is set in the near future. But what's underneath is is a longer term, um, a longer term uh, awareness uh, of a presence of a Métis guardian and an AI trickster spirit, and and the two are aware of each other intergenerationally. And the questions that that are raised thematically through that are, you know, inter intergenerationally, you know, th that's that is something where the, the the kindred connection and wisdom of of an ancestor. With with someone who who is a a, a younger uh, person listens to them that kind of a relationship across time between a guardian and them is is also something that an AI can't really understand or manipulate. It's this spiritual connection where it can't be made into a direct link, no matter how hard it could ever try. That's why there's there's all these hearkenings of memory in the film where where the the protagonist Margot is constantly remembering her, her Kukum, who, who she grew up with as an orphan raised. And, and yet was, was there this strange and, and you know, up to this point, um, unknown uh, murder of her, of her guardian, her Kukum, ultimately looking at, at, at that relationship across time and across generations to, to, to show that the power of the human spirit and the power of the mind and the our, our memories and imagination for so many is that place of freedom, that frontier of freedom. And with, you know, the current unprecedented events of the pandemic, for example, leading us all to be sequestered by necessity, it goes to show that, you know, the last frontier of freedom, you know, in front of us is, is, our, is freedom in our mind and to protect and fight for those freedoms. And freedoms in the land are what the Métis have fought hard for and will continue to fight hard for. I think that's where, on a very fundamental level, that's where a lot of these 
conversations come from where I'm from is, you know, the, there's a lot of my ancestors inside the character of Kukum, you know, what they wanted back then, what they were fighting for, you know, they, they didn't think the world would become so complicated a place as it is now. And there, there we are fast forwarding before we know it into this near future that we find ourselves in where, where, where there's these, these entangled cables and wires of complexity that, that are, are, are trying to uh, control or listen in on or understand our, our own lives before us. But, you know, ultimately you, you, you look at the generational aspect too. That's where I think on the most fundamental level, there's, um, there's a lot of my ancestors in this story too. It's great. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, obviously that's, um, you know, you're telling this great story. It's this sort of, you know, um, uh, science fiction, crime noir, you know, uh, Blade Runner kind of, you know, energy to it, which is really, really wonderful. It has a, a lot of genre elements. And so those of you that really like the sci-fi genre, this is a must-see film uh, in that regard. But it, as you say, it has this, as, as you just described now, it's sort of anchored in something deeper in yourself. And it really comes across uh, and uh, it really does speak and add to the sort of um, the growing body of work of uh, in, uh, indigenous futurism. So, you know, like that part is really cool. And I, I really, really enjoyed that as a viewer, uh, just as a storyteller in the same community. And so I was really kind of excited about that. And that's why I'm happy we got a chance to sort of hear you explain that, that side of the film for yourself. Another part, I, I guess, you know, getting to the nuts and bolts part as a director, one thing that's quite impressive about your work, whether it's your earlier film, Northlander, and this one, Parallel Minds, your sophomore film, um, is you have this unbelievable ability and total gumption considering the budget levels that you're working at to create worlds. And I really wanna take a moment here where you could explain to us, I, I wrote a couple notes down just about who you worked with. Uh, Michael, uh, Mike Casper as a production designer, who worked on Northlander as a prop master. Uh, Shannon Joel Chappelle was the art director. And uh, Amandi Dabali, if I got that right, uh, was your costume designer. So, you know, just your ability to collaborate with these people and to create the world of Parallel Minds, the locations, the sets, the costumes, all the tech world, you know, it's a, uh, it was, I was, it was quite breathtaking to sort of see how you did all that. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how you worked with those, uh, those collaborators and prep to uh, create this visual world. Because it seems like anywhere you can point the camera was a great shot. And uh, that's stemming from your ability to collaborate and make that world. So what was your process and prep to create the world? Well, I mean, getting started, I, you know, every time I, I step into to tell a story, I definitely take a lot of pre pre pre-development time to uh, first get familiar and acquainted with the world, walking around it, mostly its locations. I, I like to go out to, uh, to, to find the, the world where the film will happen and spend time there uh, knowing where this could all happen before even really getting to know the characters. And then the characters one by one start to arrive. And then what they, who they are and what they think and how they respond starts to arrive from there. And then on a most deep, deeper level, you, then, then comes their reactions and their subtext. Going out from there, when it comes to looking for the world and finding it, I think each time I, I really set out to look at telling a story in a different time, uh, where it's usually far away from the present. Parallel Minds was a film that was the most nearest to present film that I had I had made. And when it comes to sci-fi, you're always navigating a different time era. What what is that world? What does it look like? What are the rules of it? Uh, what do they do? And you know, it it of course depends on on level of resources and what your ceiling is. But letting those become your variables, your operating variables, and and that way you're you 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 answer those fundamental questions of how do people communicate? What clothing do they wear? What do this, what do their locations and rooms and environments look like to them? Um, when it comes to the Northlander, and we'll, we'll look at a clip of this coming up soon. Uh, you know, when it comes to working in outdoor nomadic environments, you know, you're, you, you're dealing with completely different production design and costume and wardrobe variables on a film like Northlander. With Parallel Minds, it was, it was a lot of close claustrophobic environments and locations where a lot of the the characters represented the world they come from. You have the the the, the very uh, smart and intelligent laboratory research analysts and programmers, and then you have the heroic uh, get it done by whatever means necessary cyber hacker. You then you have the the 
deep vaulted uh, menaced uh, artificial intelligence buried in, in some kind of a mainframe that's very thick and dense. I found that, you know, when I was looking for locations, there just weren't any, like we, we had to build 10 different sets uh, with Shannon, Joel Chapel. He, he, him and I had really uh, strong conversations way ahead of time on, on what the sets would look like. Like a lot of the, the rooms had to be not four walls. They had to be five or six walled rooms. Um, and, and all the, the, the walls were, were, were carefully laser cut, uh, you know, and every stage of it from the lighting and installation, all of it was really uh, thought out down to the frequency that the lighting in the, the different rooms would take on to, to, to be just right. So when it came to costumes, you know, we were certainly doing some overseas sourcing and, and, and deciding, you know, how, what, what would they have for cell phones? You know, I mean, they're going to, are they going to hold up phones in the movies? And, and I'll go on the record by saying now that I'm, I'm also in the, in the club of people who don't like when people put cell phones onto their face during movies, as many of you can attest. So those are the kinds of uh, those are the kinds of variables that go into deciding production design and, and working with them months and months ahead of time. I mean, I'm, I'm very adamant about getting those people artistically involved and, and hearing their thoughts, working with them on, 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 you know, not just not just, you know, this is this is our film with with these kinds of sci fi variables. But but how can we still, you know, push push the limits at, to the best we can here? So. Uh, they were they were fantastic to work with all of them and a lot of them uh, I worked with again as repeat collaborators um, some of them uh, but because my my film that I just had finished last summer uh, the first encounter was shot in a different province uh, I, I used a different crew and production design crew uh, for that one just because we were physically in another province but uh, I definitely worked again with Shannon and Joel Chapel he's he's been with me on on two of these films already so it's, uh, you know, working with, you know, just, just like the Coen brothers, right? You find your, your collaborators that you, you trust and you develop a shorthand with and, and you, you can work fluidly together on a, on a system of trust and understanding. And you're, you're, that, that's where you, you really find that you get some really great momentum going. Maybe, maybe why don't we watch a clip? Because, I mean, I love looking at these worlds that you created. I mean, if you want to watch two in a row, what, you know, you call it out to our tech guru, Ryan, and uh, let him know what, what clip or clips you want us to play here to, to feed us. Let the audience see how cool this world is that you created. Perfect. So, Ryan, why don't we play a clip from The Northlander and then uh, clip two from Parallel Minds back to back. I want you to think of something from your past, something you remember very, very well. Yeah, I'd rather not. I'm trying to help you. Concentrate, detective.
Very cool. <laughs> and, and that's it. So, it, yeah, no, you can really get a sense of two of the, um, like your play with color in the sets too, which is really quite uh, striking as well. You know, like the the blue of um, uh, Greg's character, the black of Amber's character, like really setting them out on these paths uh, visually throughout the whole film was really a, a lot of great strong choices and decisions there. And and also just like that flashback of the green with the, the black spray painting on the walls and he closes the door, which is at these little black blob, uh, you know, kind of a grimy place, obviously, you know, and then, you know, the room he's in and the elevators with those strip lights and, you know, this red stuff on the leather sofa thing with these circular things that he's sitting in it's just like all and then there's a, in the office space there's these fluorescents that are exposed down the walls like just there's a lot of great work on the art direction and i'm just you know how often were you sort of going on the set and sort of saying more of this less of that what was your process to create those i know we talked a bit about the you know the the, the thing but like literally nuts and bolts you know how long did it take you to build all those sets the way you have them in the film because it's great Right. Well, and that's the thing, you know, you, 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 you look at resources, right? That's one thing, but we, they say you can have, you know, you can have three things, right? You can have it, you can have it fast, you can have it good, you can have it cheap or, or expensive, you know, pick two of the three, right? So, you know, when it comes to time, I, I think that the collaborators I work with love having a lot of time to be able to like try things, tweak things, take a look at it. You know, there was a, there were two or three of our sets where literally like the, the geometry of them was, was very different at first. And then we stepped in and this was you know two weeks before they had to be finished and we decide on on you know color tones so that it, it can be uh shown right and also thematic colors you know that that are just right you know not too not too much but just just so um you know and and you know it is a lot of technical work i mean you know i like working in unfamiliar territory each time um it gives you a chance to discover things in a way where for the first time the way characters ultimately discover too you know at first um, you know, very first film uh, that was a track record film I did was it was decidedly a realm that I knew would would be eventually upon me and I knew nothing about it going in at first that would be visual effects. So in doing Agophobia, it's a film that we don't have the clip for this film but but we people listening can search it up Agophobia. It's a, a transhuman odyssey of, of a, a digital avatar escaping a digital world. There was about 400 individual visual effects shots each, which it had like about six layers of 3D activity going on, just a mind bender, uh, you know, and, and when, when most ambitious features, you know, and some have the nerve in 90 minutes to have to have 200 shots this entire 30 minute show was purely cgi and it took like eight months and in, and it went on to festivals and it was a film and experience that brought me to where i am today you know and it was through that experience was a was a technical post-production odyssey but one of the most awakening experiences for me certainly mm -hmm. the skills i derived from it i still use today but in choice amounts and where it's important for the story, you know, and those zooming in, you know, we'll find them toward the end of my latest film, Parallel Minds, where you'll see the, the AI creature. And, and as you know, another film, uh, I, you know, another film I did between two of them, I wanted the feeling of, you know, being sent of being a spirit moving quickly through the forest. And you, you see, you see it with directors like Sam Raimi uh, attaching the camera on, on the front of a camera on a motorbike and evil dead and chasing the actors through the forest and they're running. And, you know, this one was attached high up in a series of zip line shots where the camera was like uh, the is sprinting with the actor running like from here to there for like 30 second runs places. You wouldn't dare to bring a drone, but between the trees using the forest as a way to move the camera. And then, and then after that movie, I did Northlander. And that experience was allowing the landscape to become like a character of its own. I mean, we, we journeyed far and we saw many views and locations and, and each of them spoke by way of where the different bands of, of, of Last Ark would have their village in, in their nomadic way or, or be moving through a valley or punctuated by these like rare points of geography where, where the sand was completely black. And, you know, from building a village in 2015 in Northlander to building 10 different sets in, for Parallel Mind in studios. I mean, th it just had to happen. They needed, they, this, this was like fundamental. So having a lot of lead time ahead of time, the amount you can challenge yourself and those around you, you know, is, is, is your task. And these kinds of tasks are what you set upon yourself to accomplish with your team. 
Amazing. It's great work on that side of things. And there's so many levels. And I wanted, I don't know if you want to set, do a clip beforehand, but I wanted to get into, you know, the casting process, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily how you work with the cast on set. We'll, we'll, we'll lead into that. I thought maybe yeah. we could just start with what was your casting process? Did you, were you making offers? Were you having auditions? Did you already like, I know exactly who I want? Uh, how, how did that process work for you? Well, casting came about with looking on Parallel Minds, it was, it was ultimately, the detective Thomas Elliott was, was a very key character because he, he, he needed to have a boldness uh, and, this, and yet be very inquisitive and, and very smart and, and quick-witted. So, so I knew it would require an actor that had a lot of chops. And, and so, you know, there's a few that stuck out, but ultimately the one, you know, who also has like, uh, I guess a, a film, a familiarity with sci-fi was Greg Brick. So Greg, Greg was really great to work with in that regard quickly. And, and so he, he brought his A game to set every day and, and would try different things out and, and, you know, work with me before takes on a line and, and say, you know, would it, how, about, how about this? Or why don't I try this? And, and, you know, sometimes it was just tweaks and adjustments, mostly just so that they look right. And so he was always doing really good. There's, you know, there's a lot more swearing that, 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 that guys like him bring, bring to set that, that, uh, you know, you, I guess there's only swear word, it's only so many swear words you can have in a, in a, in a feature film uh, from coming, coming out of Canada. But uh, I thought, you know, you think about it, you know, what if there'd be a film where, where, you know, it would try to have the most swear words ever done in a film. I, I was thinking about that. Swear the movie. Um, but uh, what, so just, to, so just to go through it. So the, those big parts, you were just making offers at, at, when you went through the casting process. You, you did your research, you said, oh, this person for that role, you maybe had a coffee meeting with people or was it just pure offers? I know exactly who's gonna do great on this. I usually like to look at like, I look at like a, like a final movie poster, right? Where you see all the different cast members there and, and every cast member is like a different color that, that you pair them together, right? Like you can't have, sometimes you can't have one with another cause, cause of age or, or just look. So like, I, I'm really cognizant of look and demeanor and how they, how, how actors come across because it, it's a lot about energy. I mean, yeah, actors, as they say, a lot of the times they show up and yeah, they're playing a character but they're really just a version of themselves. So you can, you can really get that feeling when you you know watch certain other performances so you do your homework ahead of time you you look like you look at like two or three I narrow it down usually I did the same thing for all the films I, I usually like I'll narrow it down to like two or three and then from there try to do the pairing and and there's sort of a, a like an order of who you know is first to to go by and then from there you know you you work around it uh not knocking down the pegs one by one with the with the different actors so it was Greg Brick at first then it was Michelle Thrush uh, who I, I just wanted to work with her again. And she had, a, there was a role that was just perfect for her um, that, that I thought, oh, like A and B. So that, that just made a lot of sense to me, both, both like in terms of meaning, meaningfulness and also the look and the age and everything. So that was just an easy fit for Michelle Thrush. And also because she's from Alberta where, where I'm from, which is great. And then, and then Tommy Amber Peary also came about after that. And she matched well with Greg Brick for the, their age and their, their wit and their intellect and how fast they both are. So, you know, it, it, it's, it, it sometimes could be the case where some, some actors are really quick witted, really fast. And then other, other actors, they take their time more. And, you know, you, it just depends on the kind of movie you have, you know, if both of them need to kind of ride at the same wavelength, that's really what, uh, what, what, what it was about this time. That's great. Yeah, no, it's a fantastic cast. Do you want to, do you want to play another clip and sort of just let, 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 let's see them dance and sing together? <laughs> sure, Ryan. Yeah, we'll, we'll pop on another one. How about, uh, how about clip number three? Let's do that one. use this thing to patch into it? Already done. But it's voice and it continues to change on me. All I can see in there are three struts. What powers them? Check the readings. The mapping's showing me a three-way combo. Adrenaline, endorphins, serotonin. Jade, those are hormones. Holy shit. It's harvesting us. I think it wants to become human. Jade, we have to stop this thing. Maybe this thing has all the same problems that every other thing has when it ages. If, 
If I can create a feedback loop with the right magnetic oscillation, I might be able to overwhelm it, giving it the equivalent of an electronic heart attack. Very cool. Interesting on, on her, she, uh, Madison Walsh, I mean, you know, sometimes uh, when it comes to, you know, the, the relative amount of star, star potential or star power that certain actors bring, you know, sometimes casting can be about that. But in the case of Madison, I, I was searching and searching and I wanted something, someone really interesting looking and really good to play this this hacker character Jade and 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 I found I found Madison and, and she she had actually done a lot of um, comedy shorts like short films hmm. that were comedies and, and you know I thought in that in those great funny moments that she has she's got a character that I think like well yeah she'll will do everything to make her look like Jade but what what she's going to bring is going to be her personality to this and and in seeing that she really brought that spirit of jade drayton to life who's this wily cyber renegade character so she was a pleasure it's a it's a tremendous cast and, and what was what was your process uh in prep with the actors what did you have table reads did you just do rehearsals you know to get let people sort of you know any hacker training or was it uh you know uh, was it just sort of like look we don't have any time you know wardrobe fitting i'll meet you then and then we're just go right into shooting what was what was your prep with your actors like right well you know what for for certain characters Yes, I needed it. I needed it to to have a lot of the the other um, the other uh, side characters and supporting actors rise to the level of of like Greg Brick and and so Tommy Amber as well. And both of them, you know, working with with uh, those actors, like getting them familiar with what what they're doing, the significance behind it. Like Wilma Pelly, who plays Kukum, working with her ahead of time was important to have her really gra grasp the like the the long nature of her generation generation of, of the stories. So sometimes with these characters, you know, they're, we're seeing them in, in, in these films for only these brief periods and what they mean. So you have to, you have to work them ahead of time. And otherwise, when it comes to uh, uh, characters that have a lot of like mechanical things to do, I do like to do um, rehearsals ahead of time. Northlander, we, we had a lot of stunts. Uh, you know, there was some days where we had eight actors choreographed and fight scenes with stunt coordinators. And those were times where, yeah, we had to sequence everything ahead of time and work with stunt coordinators to, to make sure that it was right and how the camera would come in at them and be, be in their place was a part of it. This one didn't have as many stunts, so so I didn't need to do that too, too much. But but other times, Greg Brick, actually, he, he showed up ready. You know, I didn't have any rehearsal time with him, which is not uncommon. <laughs> he seems to wear his character well. <laughs> yeah, well, in your film. I, I, I saw him in Code Eight uh, as well. Uh, Jeff Chan's Code Eight, and which, which you know, they were making that film for a while as well. And and so you know, Greg, Greg is is, is uh, in can across Canada. If you need someone who's rough around the edges and wily, look no further. And, and uh, I mean, Tommy had quite a lot of you know intense scenes. She had a lot of emotional intense scenes, uh, and they were handled really, really well. Um, and I'm wondering what was your your Greg seems like he's an old car that just, you know, hums along the highway and it's all cruisy. But, uh, t you know, for um, uh, Tommy, it seemed like it was a bit, you know, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's some character, some depth and some confusions and, you know, some struggles. And you really brought those out in certain se scenes and sequences. What was that process like? Right. Well, you know, she she definitely had a lot of questions uh, that that. I think related to the amount of understanding she would have or not have uh, up to certain points. And, and, you know, as, as the, the writer director, I had to always kind of like catch us up at what, at what point, at what, what checkpoint are we in, in her understanding as this is a, a mystery plot film, you know, you're, you do have to advise your characters only what they know up to that point. And, and, and when you're at the monitor, you know, you're looking to see, you know, does, does that, uh, understanding, like, does it come across? Is it, you know, is the, the, when the light bulb goes off, when he learns something in her case, you know, when, like when she was, um, I think there, there's a clip we haven't seen yet that uh, I think we ought to roll after I, I mentioned this, um, you know, 
anytime a director is working with with actors, they they often have that question: How much do I know? You know, where am I at this very point? So so when it comes to you know her understanding, especially because it, it's a mystery plot, you know, a lot of times the layers of the story get slowly revealed, and only you know only so much, but only only so little at the same time. So. So that was something with her where, you know, she, she really wanted to and did bring that, that, that yearning to, to learn, to know, because she had that vested interest. It was so, it was so near and dear. It was like this part of her past that it frustrated her because it was so close and yet she didn't, it, it wasn't so, it wasn't made obvious to her right, right off the bat. And so she, she had that friction all throughout the film as, as, as this, uh, feisty and frustrated researcher. Normally, researchers are, are a little more on the level at first. That's what that's who we see her as. So, on that note, we'll we'll play uh, one of the clips, Ryan, and uh, and we'll we'll get into to Margot Elson's memories here. I think it's clip number clip number one. Or uh, let's see here. yes, clip number one. I want you to think of something from your past, something you remember very, very well. Yeah. I think we already played this clip, Ben. Is, is this the right one? This one, it would be one of the other clips that we haven't played so far. Uh, copy that. Try clip four. Copy that. Congratulations, you found your way in. This place is really nice. You decorate yourself. Huh. I'll run you through a newspaper roller if you want to be on the funny pages. What are you doing here? We're looking for you. Well, duh. Don't make me ask again, Tommy boy. We're looking for information about a woman you might have heard of. Elise Perot. My name just sent a chill down my spine. Some names come with baggage. I know who you are. How? I got a helmet for you to crack. Do you know what happened to her? Memories are our past and our future. The answer, Margot, is in here. Hey. Don't be such a pedestrian. You've wandered into a war that no one knows is being waged. A war of conscience and knowledge. If you blink, your freedom will disappear. It will be taken. If you don't fight for your freedom, you've sided with them. This is the Yellow Brick Road, baby. getting into it again. I wanted to see the rest of the scene. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, I, working with your actors, um, I'm always curious about, you know, everyone, different directors processes, you know, um, when you're, when you're marking up your scripts and you got your binder, because there's a photo of you, you know, on set with your binder. And, and so wondering what, uh, uh, what kind of notes are you making for your actors scene to scene? Are you noting this is the turning point of the scene? This is your, you know, what you're looking to get. These are your conflicts that you're, you know, your uh, each uh, adjustment you're making. Uh, are you using action verbs from the Judith Weston kind of, you know, how to direct actors? Like what's your process with working with actors and prepping for yourself to work with actors on set? Right. So, so, I mean, acting, you know, is very, it's, it's emotional when you're there in the moment doing it. 
And I, th I think that's where a lot of times, you know, and, and it's about style too. I mean, some, sometimes directing style is uh, uh, more mechanical and I kind of, I like a balanced approach of both when, when I, when I work, I like to, to, to explore the emotions of the actors uh, with, with regard to if it's a, a scene of two or a scene of three, uh, you, you can, you know, you can decide from which perspective is the, 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 the visual, the, the mentality, the, the, the eyes of the film, which, which way are they pointing in this scene, the perspective wise. And then, you know, with, with uh, giving notes and adjustments, I usually like to let the actors uh, explore during the first take because they, they do prepare something ahead of time and they, they usually like to get it out there at first. And, and I mean, you know, with some, some, with the exception of, of the pros who are always just on and they, 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 they do great. And even on take one, um, you know, most, most, you know, by their, I'd say the second and certainly the third take, that's when they've really warmed up into what they're doing. So uh, I let them explore during take one. And then I, I kind of look for ways to obviously compliment, but then also give an adjustment uh, to try certain things. And if they're working, I'll say, look, this was working. Now this is like this, this one, let's just, let's try approaching it from this other emotional angle and give them some kind of keyword or key thought to focus on while they're doing it because it'll prompt them, right? They need that, that urge to, in order to, uh, conjure the, the, the performance out of them. And, and so they, they usually, uh, they, they usually try to, to implement that. And sometimes if it's, if the, if they do it in that direction and then they, they uh, if it was good, but just for, for, for the sake of variety for the edit, you know, when we turn around on the other actor, sometimes I think it's really, it can introduce some really great editing possibilities to just try the performance emotionally from a different perspective for the sake of variety. And that way it can go, it can go back and forth between them. And that's talking, you know, once you're in the meat of a scene and the dialogue is starting, because when it comes to like the, the tail ends of scenes, like you're talking like how to flow the story, how to, you know, have maybe actors like they're going to say something and you're going to be on this big shot coming in of something. So, you know, that's where style is, is, is also real important too for the, the cinematography and like letting it speak. I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're asking, you know, like you look at films like from the Coen, the Coen brothers are a good example, right? They can take a, a single shot and make it look really meaningful. Uh, just a single shot of a car driving down a snowy road in, in North Dakota, but the way that they frame the shot to introduce Jerry Lundegaard driving. And they, it's like this, the car is like really bottom of the frame. And then it's this huge sky right above him is sort of, you know, it says it can say, you can say so much with just the cinematography as well. So, you know, I, I think uh, working methodically with collaborators, technically, artfully is always really important. I do storyboard every scene and okay. show. Yeah, I, I definitely, I use, I use programs to, to do that. And I, I arrive with a binder and I pull them out for the day and, and mark them up and say, oh, we can land here. But you don't marry yourself to those, right? You're only like your, your uh, I don't know, your approach, right? But, but it leaves you with that that spontaneity, right? Where you can still be spontaneous with your performers every time. So when you're doing, you're doing like a floor plan, bird's eye view, and then you're, then you're after that, you're rendering out storyboards and then you come with that kind of very, kind of your clear vision of what you want with your actors working out the, well, I'm gonna go into camera in a second, but I just wanted to sort of ask, just sort of close off on the, I'm just curious about your process. Um, are you sort of saying like, are you trying to convince the actors that this is the blocking that they wanna do for their characters? Or are you sort of like, you know, the, the rumor of Woody Allen that you're, you know, you're gonna stand here, the shots here, you're gonna move there. And this is the way it's gonna be because that's the way I planned it. What's your process in the blocking? <laughs> it's it's fluid. I, I usually I usually will first step in with with those storyboards for the blocking, but that's where the spontaneity kicks in. Is is once I, I go through it with the actors, and then it allows us to to decide how the sequence moves. There's a sequence in in Parallel Minds. We don't have a clip for it now, but they they arrive to an old homestead on a hill, and the way we shot that scene was like we we did the whole thing. It was like a three and a half minute come up to the house, enter the house, walk through the door, look around the ground floor everywhere and land in the kitchen. And, and so doing that whole scene like that, it, it's a lot of moving parts with, with the performers and what they're feeling. And sometimes it's straightforward when, when they're coming into a new location. 
uh, you, know, you, you know, a lot of times in films, there's characters exploring places they've never been before. So it's just where do, where do they and how do they navigate that new place? That's where storyboards really come in handy. Lots of arrows, like arrows are just pointing in, in, in those all kinds of directions for camera. Yeah. And then, and then awesome. there, you, know, you're, you let your actors definitely, like you listen for sure, because you know, you, that way it's, it, it flows dramatically. Um, there's there's some a lot of delicious uh, blocking and, and coverage that you got and, and uh, quite a few scenes and um, I, I really like the way that the car driving uh, scenes were with this kind of streaky light going on and the great use of sort of you know here's the here and now so to speak and then here's when you're under the influence of this uh, you know this contact lens is you know that AI thing. Um, what uh, what was your process collaborating with uh, your uh, your DP uh, Jeff Maher? What was that process like? You know, to get into the look and the lensing. It, it sounds like you're also quite adept with you know the gear talk. Um, I'm just curious, you know, how you went through that process. Right. Well, Jeff and I, you know, we we took a look at different lens packages and we we thought the same way on a lot of wavelengths he he had this great idea where he he thought let's try let's try to to have this film feel like for the most part there's always some kind of movement going on Creep, creeper shots a lot of them were happening that way because it, it makes sense for the type of narrative that this is a lot of a lot of cr uh, slow reveals of things or, or, or creep along movements so in that sense it made a lot of sense for him to want to do that and and I'm all in favor of that too uh, when it comes to when it comes to certain things like the the, the cameras we we shot with, uh, um, you know, we 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 usually use you know the digital cinema cameras, but we we used old lenses to give some kind of a of a vintage look to certain scenes. It really brought out the bloom of the lights. Uh, so all those little details, you know, add to the realism because I do like to do things practically as well. Uh, you know, it's it, it gets back to the the magic of of movies way back in the day when when it used to be magic tricks. Um, one thing towards the end of the film, not to spoil it, but there's a in, there's an intense moment where Margot Elson, the actor, uh, Margot is is uh, in a in a nightmare memory and being buried alive. And so in a, in accomplishing that, it was a lot of technical moving parts where you 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 know. I remember, you know, as a director, you know, you have your, you have a vision and you really want to stick to those certain things. And, and, you know, ultimately what will, as far as style goes and framing and, and push going for those moments, you'll be trying to be talked out of those moments a lot. And whether it's for health, for safety, for all those things. And, and the question is, you know, what hills do you stand on when you, when you, you have those creative things that you really want to do. And for, for me, it was fighting for the scene where she's buried alive. And, and so, we, you know, we, we tried all these different things that had to be all health and safety. And, and of course, I mean, it, it ended up being this, um, this edible kind of uh, oatmeal sawdust. But anyways, it, you know, it looks like sand and for all intents and purposes, it is. And, and so in doing that, it was all this technical thing where, you know, we had to build a, a, ca a caged set around her and, and Jeff had to had to frame up in certain places and, and that's where you 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 let these professionals do their their job and and you you end up with those those uh, performances from them and, and let them be you know that's where it's important for them too to shine yeah i mean it looks great there's really great stuff going there and i, I you can definitely see the as you're describing when we open you know the sort of evolution of you know this film to that film uh, it's also the evolution of the director with more chops and, you know, to see like even that little red electric in that last clip, you know, that little red uh, gate that was holding him back uh, in that scene that you put in in post, you know, it's great. It's just all these little things and it's really well done. What was uh, just, yeah, you know, we're going to get obviously get into the release where people can see it coming up, but I also just want to, you know, give us a chance also to do explore your work in post-production. Um, the sound design is fantastic. Each room has a space. The characters, the thematics that are coming out in the score, very beautiful stuff. Um, and, you know, just the pace of the editing. What was, what was it like, you know, you can take that any way you want, but, you know, your, your post-production workflow and sort of, I, I, you know, it sounds like you also, uh, uh, you have from coming from a, such an, a lower budget independent work mode, you're familiar with a lot of modes of filmmaking. You don't just hand somebody a drive and say, I'll see you in a month. I didn't get that sense from your bio and from your other work and 
hearing about you in the community that you're sort of like, there's a lot of levels and skills that you're bringing to every film you do, which is quite astounding. What was your post process like? Right. Well, yeah. And, and certainly, you know, uh, as a Canadian, you're right. I mean, I, I was, I was, I came into this, you know, with, with just stories, right. Stories and, and, and the, the audacity to try and tell them in these, in these fantastical ways and picking it up, um, you know, and, you know, each, each time having different, different scales and levels of resources to work with uh, ultimately does guide how the production and then post-production process goes. The two really work in tandem with one another. Uh, talking about that earlier science fiction I did was 400 visual effect shots. I mean, you know, you get to a certain budget level where uh, you still want to keep things on a manageable basis with with how you do visual effects, um, you know, post-production wise, there's there, you know, in terms of storytelling, there's there's certain approaches creatively that can really enhance a film and be very easy and manageable. Um, those things are things like compositing, reframing, replacements, or or even motion blur. That those can just enhance sequences fully and just bring something to life in in literally minutes. Where, whereas, you know, sometimes if you're not, not careful, you'll, you might wander down the pathway of particles, flames, hair, creatures, fluids. It, it, those, are, those are expensive. So, though, and yet, fire, animals, environmental, water, those are real. So be practical with those things. Find ways to be practical with those things is, is, is what you do when you're, when you're doing the shooting and, and you're designing it, storyboarding and everything. And then when you're in post-production, you know, you're, you, you really, you, you, you have 150 shots to, to do something visual, visual effects and, and, you know, certain amount of those shots are broken into your sequences that you work by and you, you just decide what eggs to put in what basket. So then there's, there's that. And then, you know, what sound design, as we know, is, is the, it's the, the total flow and feeling of a film. I mean, if, if you want to learn about how to edit a film, you, you mute the feature film you're watching and you just, watch it silent you just you can just watch the edit go and then and then you know when it comes to music you know you 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 the music you feel the whole film too which you know that's really the flow of the emotions of all your actors and characters one by one through the film and it's 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 characteristic to each film right you know when it comes to you know f films like like you know uh, uh film like co I, I look at recent films code eight or Aquila's escape or or uh uh, target number one, which were all Canadian films that came out this year. Like you know, a lot of them have these really driving, intense uh, sound elements to them that that are so important to the characters. And and of course, silence is is also very important too when it comes to conveying things. Not not only having it be uh, like a, a constant layer of things. So those are all those are all part of your post production. And um, and also you know talking about theatrically releasing. When it comes to um, you know films, also you know for for those of us you know tuning in, some of the younger filmmakers out there, you know, we, when it comes to uh, theatrically releasing in theaters versus digital on on LCD screens and televisions, um, you, the project the movie projector actually will show films like and it, it'll almost drop like two two or three f stops darker than if you're watching it digitally. So you almost need like two master files. Uh, that you'll deliver to either your your, your DCP master to th your theatrical exhibitor, and then your 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 digital master for your TV and your digital release, because th the light's coming out of a screen versus being like projected at a at a silver screen, and you lose some light from the distance of it. There's a, a couple questions in the Q and A. Um, I just thought I would uh, tackle some uh, right now with you. Um, one is, I'm assuming this is a no, but maybe there's a surprise thing that can happen here. Any clips from the first encounter that you can show, Benjamin? Ooh, I, I can't. I, we, we, we would be close, but, uh, but that one um, is still underway. And actually, I would, uh, to be honest, if I had a clip uploaded right now, I would if it was, if it was available. But uh, for, 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 for next year. It'll be for next year. So soon enough, I promise. In uh, the same uh, person, I'm always, I'm, the only name I see here is Sif Moderator. So hello, Sif. Uh, Sif also asks, uh, uh, was there any difficulties in funding uh, the film in Alberta? 
Well, I think, you know, interesting question. Um, and, and, you know, on that note, because it's, it's the same uh, regarding first encounter, uh, I, do, I do think I, I'd like to, to mention because, you know, there has been a lot of changes in tax credits and there always is changes throughout the, the years. And so Al Alberta recently had a change of government with the tax credit that was a 30% all spend. And, and it was, I would say around the third or fourth uh, most competitive in Canada, where you, you did have a lot of, uh, you know, films that come up from LA and TV series coming up to shoot. Um, when it comes to Canadian feature films, uh, they, the incentive is the same, it's, it's 30%. And so that's what we had for uh, Alberta. There wasn't uh, for Parallel Minds because that was under the previous regime. Of, of the Alberta Media Fund system. It was very smooth, very uh, dependable and predictable, um, no surprises. And, and so everything went really smoothly, tickety-boo with that one. But First Encounter, on the other hand, when it came to uh, shooting that film, I mean, a large part of the reason uh, why we shot my next feature film coming out next year in Manitoba was because the Manitoba tax credit uh, certainly had one of the strongest most competitive numbers uh, in all of the country. We we had sixty five percent labor, uh, which it it, it 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 was essentially twice the amount of of tax rebate we would have got if we shot in Alberta or more. So that that was it, it was a very obvious choice that way. And then and then to to echo the question of difficulties um, when it came to when it, because it, this next movie is a it's an interprovincial co-production between Manitoba and Alberta. We did, we were tapping into both streams of the tax credit and the Alberta one literally switched during our filming and a lot of productions, not only first encounter, but a lot of them had like, especially ones that were all, all Alberta shot. Some of them were at the Calgary film festival this very year. They had a huge shakeup where, you know, they, they probably had, tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars of tax credit that they were counting on that, that they would have probably already spent in production, you know, uh, basically reduced to their 24%, uh, they call it like a app, like a selective tax credit, but that's a, thankfully for parallel minds, it was smooth. Yeah. It was smooth. Um, and so we got to look to be wrapping things up and I'm wondering if you want to share with us all, uh, where we can see Parallel Minds and what its uh, rollout is going to be. I know everything's subject to change with COVID stuff, but what's the plan uh, moving ahead looking like? Right. Well, when it comes to releasing a film, so at the moment, the film's an official selection in, in 13 international film festivals, including Fantaspoa, the largest film festival of sci-fi fantasy in South America, and also in uh in the Caribbean, in Brazil, in, in uh, Toronto, at the, the Blood in the Snow Festival that's taking place uh, in, in late October, and also Cinefest Sudbury. And, and so there's a really great representation of the film also at Indigenous film festivals, including the 45th American Indian Film Festival, which is the largest Indigenous festival in, in USA, as well as as the Native Spirit Film Festival and the Red Nation Film Festival. And then throughout October, we're already confirmed in 13 cities across Canada for our theatrical release with Landmark Cinemas. So the, the audiences will be able to, to uh, pick up the newspapers and, and look at when the film's opening in their cities. And it's, it's always opening on a Friday for the run. So that's where people can see it uh, live and in person, which is a really important aspect of this, this year, I think with, you know, what's going on with theatricals, Shane. And I, you know, it's it, it, great to know your thoughts too. We have a minute on, on, on how the whole the theatrical system has, has had a very interesting go this year and how, you know, we're used to adapting with, with uh, you know, what's, what, what, what we're handed. That's what, that's the nature of being a film director. So, so, you know, that, that's something that's been great too, you know, where with festivals like Calgary and, and also others like Vancouver, uh, you know, committing to theatrical releasing and, and having the real festival experience is, is just an incredible, uh, wonder, wonderful uh, honor of, of the real movie going experience. So, so that's been great. And the film will also be available on APTN for broadcast and primetime in December, along with the Hollywood suite. And, and so that's, that's how people can watch the film. 
Is, is there a website you want to, like, if anyone wants to sort of see how to get to those festivals? Right. So when it comes to website, um, I would, I would suggest going, going on to level film. Uh, I think their, their website is level.film. So very easy level.film. And then also you could, you could do a Google search of parallel minds and you would likely come up with landmark cinemas where it would appear in your city, or it'll, it would be available on Hollywood Suite, APTN on streaming as well. So there's, there's plenty of ways to watch it. I think it'll also be on TELUS and Shaw and, uh, and uh, those kinds of digital platforms as well through Level Film distributed. So there's plenty of ways to watch the film. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of how, how big you want the screen to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, Benjamin, congratulations, man. Uh, you got two feature films and you have a third one you're in post-production and two more that are in development. It's, uh, you're just uh, an unbelievable creator of uh, content and stories and screen uh, stories. And uh, it's great to, uh, to see you doing what you're doing, man. Congratulations on this film. It's wonderful. Thanks. Well, love being in league with you guys. I, I mean it, you know, it's great to be Canadian storyteller and, and so here we are telling our stories. Well, that's fantastic. Hans. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the zoo. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shane and Benjamin, for that fantastic conversation. Really, really wonderful to hear you guys talking about that. Shane, always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for, for guiding us through that. And Benjamin, congratulations. And, and thank you for such amazing intriguing and important work uh, on all of your films. Um, everybody uh, watch Benjamin's films, watch Shane's films for that matter. Amazing work from both of these incredible filmmakers. Uh, on October 8th coming up, join us for a conversation between incredible documentary directors, Liz Marshall and Shelley Saywell, talking about Liz's new film, Meet the Future. That's M-E-A-T, Meet the Future. It's a fascinating topic and an amazing film. Find the links and videos to all DGC Visionaries 2020 sessions at dgc.ca Visionaries 2020. Benjamin and Shane, thank you so much for spending this time with us and sharing all of your wisdom. Really, really appreciate it. Be well. Thank you, Hans. Take care. Total pleasure. Total honor. Have a good one. Thank you. You too.